The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister John Dale. Our study today is the last in the series of 12 lessons. The first was an introductory lesson and then 10 steps, one each session. And then today is our concluding study, Steps to Life in Christ. And today we look at what I'm calling caution flags. Having looked at all of the lessons, there are some things we need to be sure and guard against. Things that will be really simple in uh, some ways and some, some of it is not that simple. But I hope that you pay attention to the caution flags and if they apply to you, by all means, be duly warned. If they don't apply to you, realize they do apply to somebody else. By way of introductory statement for this study, with God's help, the study of steps to life in Christ can be a tool to help relieve our suffering, to fill our emptiness, and to help us extend to God's presence in our lives, releasing energy, love, and joy. We walk this journey one step at a time with the help of God and with the support of others. If we work the steps faithfully, we will notice improvements in ourselves, our awareness, our sensitivity, our ability to love and be free. The hope is that we would come to this point in our study with a degree of awareness and a degree of determination that would actually do us good, not just having completed 12 weeks of study, but actually being better, closer to God, more like Jesus, and a greater help and influence in the lives of others. As we do that, we find a greater sense of personal fulfillment, and that won't hurt any of us to find real fulfillment in doing what we know to be right and knowing and doing what we know helps other people. The caution flags as we look at our last lesson now, with any study, there are inherent dangers when misuse, misunderstanding, or misapplication occurs. Recognizing and acknowledging that fact, we remain determined to sift out the chaff and feed on the wheat. Some of the potential dangers from this study include, number one, the higher power, as you understand him, must be recognized as Jehovah the creator of the universe, the one true and living God. As we mentioned in the very beginning of our study, some of the principles that we're looking at in these steps are similar to the 12 steps principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have great respect for the efforts of the organization called Alcoholics Anonymous. I have tremendous respect for the people who have tried to incorporate those 12 steps into their own lives. And as they are biblically based, they are exactly what many people need. But one of the caution flags that we want to be sure and show at this point is that the higher power, as you would perceive him or as you understand him, would need to be understood that there is one true and living God. There are many gods in the world, but with a capital G and with an understanding from a biblical base, there is only one true and living God. The passages that would help us understand that would be Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel... The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And it's in that setting that Moses said to the Israelites, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And you're to teach your children. When they rise up, when they sit down, teach them by the way. And those are the fundamental principles of Old and New Testament. That is, there is one true and living God. Romans chapter 3 would tell us in the New Testament, there is one God who will justify. Sin came because of mankind in yielding to Satan's temptation. But the one who justifies is the true and living God. In Ephesians chapter 6, 
There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And so to come to understand God would have to include the truth concerning the true and living God. There's a certain exclusive nature about that that is repugnant to some. It just must be understood there is one true and living God. We would do ourselves no favors. We would do others no favors to leave the impression that a pantheistic view, that is that God is everything and God is every, in everything and that everything turns out to be God uh, is, is not true. It just isn't true. It takes its place among the many false doctrines of the world. The one true and living God is Jehovah the Creator and the Sustainer of life, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of you and me as we become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2, 5, one God and one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. Again, the point is one God, three persons making the Godhood or Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the one person <clears throat> who is the mediator between mankind and the Holy God is Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God and the Son of Man. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life and died at the age of about 33 as He was crucified on a Roman cross at the behest of the Jews who rejected Him. He's the one and only mediator between you and me and the one and only true and living God. Now, the second of these caution flags, embracing the steps can become a religion in itself, a false religion at that. And it's very important that we see this. Embracing the steps is important, it is vital, but it also has an inherent danger built into it. Please notice with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is only one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we are for Him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge, for some with consciousness of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. The specific context of 1 Corinthians 8 would have to do with eating meat that has been offered to an idolatrous God, and Paul is simply saying it was cooked there, it was cooked, you can eat it, but you have to also take into consideration the consciences of the people who don't understand that. And as you and I would be very much aware and, and conscious of the fact that people are not all at the same level spiritually, we would not want to violate the conscience of somebody else. So there is one true God. There is one true Lord Jesus Christ. You know that and I know that. But what we can do is end up with false gods that the world and its inability to understand the true God would see the steps or the meeting of the group discussing and implementing the steps as a replacement for the church. It's not a replacement. It doesn't become a religion in itself, but it is simply an implementation of the true religion as you read about it in your Bible. It, it addresses a certain area of need. It is not a rewriting of the Bible. It is not the establishment of a newfound church. We all need to read the same Bible, be followers of Jesus Christ and part of His one body, the spiritual body, which is His church. Therefore, sons and daughters of God and brothers and sisters to each other and not start a new religion. The world has way too many religions now. So we certainly don't want to start another one. And so the steps religion is not a religion. The steps are simply some tools to help us as we address the issues of life that can be very, very challenging and even heartbreaking. The second of these passages is in Colossians chapter 2 at verse 23. 
where the Apostle Paul said, These things have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility, neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Again, the point is, there is a self-indulgence, there is a false religion, there are many things that people do in the name of religion that are not resulting in what praises God. We just want to praise God His way, not our way. Not to devise and develop new plans, new theories, and new avenues of worship. The third of these passages is James chapter 1, a more familiar passage. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. But James has said earlier, especially in verses 26, 25 and 26, that when we look into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, being not forgetful hearers but a doer of the word, then God will be blessed or God will bless those who do that. But he said, if someone seems to be religious but doesn't bridle his tongue, James says, this man's religion is vain. There is vain religion and there is pure and undefiled religion. What we're wanting is pure and undefiled. The world has seen its fill of the vain. So we want to exercise and wave the caution flag that says the steps cannot be allowed to become a religion in themselves. The Lord's religion revealed in the text of Scripture is the only one needed and the only valid one out there. But the steps can help us to implement what the Lord has said. Step number three, or caution number three. Since everyone has issues in his or her life that need addressing, it's easy to justify wrong deeds because, after all, all have sinned. All have sinned. Now notice from Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 16, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to Him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. Now while it's true that all have sinned, we must not allow ourselves to become discouraged and to simply move away from condemnation of sin because it is such a universal malady and problem. We need to go back and see what the Lord hates. And if the Lord hates something, you and I need to learn to hate it. He doesn't hate people, but He hates sin. He hates wicked deeds. And because of His hatred for wickedness, we develop a stronger hatred for wickedness too as we understand what these steps are actually telling us. John chapter 3, classic passage in discussion with Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night. First, they discussed the new birth. And then they discussed Moses in the wilderness as he lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Jesus speaks about his own death that is imminent. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. The condemnation that is in the world is compared to darkness. And Jesus would say, Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Now the point being made is, sin, though it's universal, is not to be condoned, it is not to be ignored, we don't ever want to come to the point of saying, well, since there's so much sin, you have yours and I have mine. What's the big deal? The big deal is sin, whatever form it takes and whoever is guilty of it, be it you or I. The guilt of sin is that which condemns us. It estranges us from the Holy Father in heaven. The one and only cleansing agent for sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I must not allow myself to become discouraged and to say, 
I, I'll just not work on my issues. I will not address my sins. After all, I'm better than 50% of the other people or 90%, whatever percentage I want to ascribe. I'm at least better than I used to be. Well, that's all fine in its place, but there has to come a point where we see sin like God does. And until we do, we'll ignore certain things in our lives or the lives of others, and that's not fair. Jesus died for sin. It was a terribly, excruciatingly painful death and I should never justify sin just because it is a universal problem. I need to oppose sin in my life and in the lives of people whom I claim to love because I claim to love the Lord who died for sin even more than I love the people. Romans 3, verse 10, There is none who does righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Say, well, I'm in good company. That's true. You're in good company. You're in company with all who've sinned against the holiness of God, and that's every human being who's accountable in the whole world. But never should that allow us in any way to justify sin in our lives or to diminish its importance. It's that important that we recognize the hatred of God for sin and the love of God for sinners. Now, caution flag number four. Since human perfection is not attainable in our unaided strength, it becomes tempting to give up and quit trying. You, you don't want to give up. Isaiah chapter 40. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. We don't want to give up, give in, and stop doing what the Lord says just because there is the human frailty and weakness and stumbling nature about us that says, I can't do this in my own unaided strength. The good news is we don't have to go at it in our own unaided strength. We have the strength of the Lord. We have the blessings of God available to us every day and all the time and in all circumstances. Therefore, when I am yielding to Satan and to sin, I'm not yielding to the power of God. When I'm yielding to the power of God, I'm not yielding to Satan and sin. And so I need to exercise myself unto godliness so that I will be a person who doesn't grow weary in well-doing. Notice Mark chapter 13, verse 13. He who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Very similar wording to Revelation 2.10. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now whether the Lord means there, be faithful even in the face of death, or be faithful as long as you live. Either way, we're to be faithful. And we have the ability to be faithful in the strength of the Lord. Constantly cleansed and forgiven by the power of the blood of Christ. We do not want to give up and quit trying just because of our human frailty. Galatians chapter 6 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 would tell us not to grow weary in well-doing or in doing that which is right. Don't give up. Don't faint and fall away. It can happen. That's why the warning is there that we not let it happen. Don't grow weary in well-doing. And then last for this point is Revelation 2.10, be faithful even unto death or until death. So what we're looking at so far is that there is one true and living God, Jehovah God. We do not want under any circumstances to leave the door open for false gods to take their place alongside the true God. The second of our caution flags is that the steps can become a religion in themselves. We do not want that to happen. The third caution flag is that since everyone has issues in his or her life, then I would take sin lightly and would justify wrong deeds just because I'm in the company of the majority. That's not fair either. And the number four says that this human perfection is not attainable 
And it's tempting to give up and to quit trying. And that's not the right approach either. Stay with it. And the last of these is number five. While God uses our family, friends, and brethren to providentially work in our lives, it is easy to put too much confidence in fallible human beings, allowing them to get too close, closer than the one Lord. And I want us to spend the remainder of our time trying to develop this point and to encourage you, even if you disagree with what I say, to at least ponder it and to be willing to study it further. And I'll be glad to talk with you privately about it. It's that important. Because one of the ways the Lord has chosen to work in every generation has been through human implementation of His Word and His will. I don't know for sure why Moses had to lead the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage, but he did. God chose that Moses would be a leader. Couldn't he have gotten those people out of Egyptian bondage some other way? Of course he could, but he chose Moses as a leader. When it came time for them to cross the Jordan into the land that flowed with milk and honey, I can't quite understand why Joshua was chosen to lead them. Why couldn't Moses go ahead? Well, there were some issues that came up and God was making a point and Moses didn't get to go into the land of Canaan. Why Joshua? Well, I understand that he and Caleb were the spies who had faith and he seemed to be a, a man of leadership and of great dependence upon God and we appreciate all of his good traits, but why did they need a leader anyway? Why did Elijah, the prophet, do what he did at Mount Carmel. I don't know that I could ever explain that. Why was John the Baptist the one who would prepare the way for the Messiah? John who would say, He must increase, but I must decrease. Why John? Why Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, Thaddeus, Simon, and Judas to be the twelve? Why not... 15? Why not 5 million? Why not just one or two? I don't know that. I don't have any way of understanding all that, but I know that the Lord in every generation has chosen to do some of His work through people, and He still does. On Pentecost, we have recorded the words of the Apostle Peter who preached the gospel in its fullness for the first time. We find that same apostle who comes to the household of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 to bring the Gentile population the gospel in its fullness for the first time. Why was he so important? And then he's overshadowed at least somewhat by the apostle Paul who wrote far more books of the New Testament than Peter did. Why Paul? I don't have a good answer for that other than the fact that that's the way God chose to do it. But God in every generation of Bible history worked much of what He did through people. And today as we look at these ten steps that we've studied, we find that people are involved with great influence in the lives of others, including family and friends. It's still true. Why are you what you are spiritually? If all of us in this room and all of us who ever view this, this uh, program, if all of us can truthfully say, I sat down independently and studied for myself and worked out all of my faith and belief, I dare say that will never happen. But what we would say is, well, I grew up in this particular home setting or I was taught in a particular church setting or I studied this with the help of somebody or many bodies and we came to our points of belief based upon a lot of influences from a lot of different sources. Now, while that's not bad, we just need to be sure and guard what those influences are and how powerful they are and the best influence in your life or mine is the one that will point us to the Savior, not the one who will point us to the preacher 
or to that denomination or to that system. That's not going to work. We have to get past denominational thinking, past human allegiances, all the way to the one and only Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life on Calvary, who arose from the grave, and who has exclusive claims on you and me. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. John 14, 6. And the Apostle Peter would say in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there in Jerusalem, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Therefore, the people who have helped you the most are the ones who pointed you to the Savior. You may have a dear, sainted grandmother who loved the Lord and read her Bible and helped you learn and learn and learn and learn, and you ought to thank God for her. And that's wonderful. But a thing isn't right just because your or my grandmother believed it. As sacred as those relationships are, the best grandparent, the best parent, the best friend is going to point you to the Savior, point you to your own Bible. And you read and study it and do what it says, not because it's family tradition, not because it's easy, but because it's right. Notice Matthew chapter 28. Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. It's in that setting that he gives what we call the Great Commission. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And he gave the great comforting promise, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the close of the age, to the end of the world. But you see, all authority rests in Jesus. He's King of kings and Lord of lords right now reigning in the hearts and lives of all who would allow him to. In addition to that, we find in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And then in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now by way of summary and conclusion to all of this, we want to emphasize that people are always important in our lives. The influence of people will be powerful, and it should be. But in order to have the caution flag waved properly, we must not allow human relationships, regardless of how wonderful they are and how well-intended they may be from all angles, we must not allow human relationships to come between us and the Lord. I've told many of you the story of an issue that happened in my life when I was in college. I'll not repeat the whole story. But in a nutshell, it simply was this. I was severely mistreated by someone in a position of authority and leadership. I was wounded critically for a while by it because in the immaturity of my 19 years of life here, I had an unrealistic view of the spiritual level of certain people in certain professions. I couldn't believe that someone in a position of leadership and authority in the church and the college would be untruthful. I had been brought up in a home where we were taught to tell the truth. As far as I know, my dad never lied to me or anybody else. I wasn't accustomed to it because the church setting in which I grew up was a church setting in which there was peace and harmony and there was love. But in that time of issue in my life, I was confronted with the fact that there is dishonesty here. It's blatant dishonesty. And my first thought was to get it corrected because I knew the truth would always win out and so I made a good valiant effort to do that and it didn't work. And then I tried even more and it didn't work either. 
And in my discouragement, in my, in my despondency, I had decided that I would drop out of school and that I would change my plans for profession. And I didn't know for sure what my faith would end up being or doing. Not a mature response, but a very human response to discouragement, especially from people who were leaders. The advice I was given by one who turned out to be a very, very dear friend and the one who pointed me away from self-centeredness <coughs> excuse me, and from doubts, pointed me away from the things that were discouraging, simply said this, no human being can be allowed to get too close. You have only one Lord, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. No human being can be allowed to get close enough to destroy that relationship unless you allow it. Keep every human being at sufficient distance so as not to be allowed to destroy you. Trust people, but trust people properly, not improperly. I was 19 years old. I'm about to be 62. I've never yet allowed anybody to get close enough to destroy me. I've had a few issues in my life that could have, if I had allowed it to, I could have turned sideways and I could have done a lot of different things, but I decided that Jesus is Lord. I've decided that His Word, the Gospel, is true. And nobody, regardless of the rank and status of that individual, nobody is allowed to sidetrack me from that unless I allow them to. And I, at this point, do not allow it. And I do not plan to. I wouldn't want you to either. Don't let anybody lead you astray, but let Jesus be your Lord, the gospel be your guide, and always be faithful to the teachings of the Lord through the gospel. And then these steps can be implemented to the glory of God and to your own good and to the good of your family and friends. And that's what it's all about. Christ-likeness, a closer walk with God. And I thank you very much for your attendance and your attention. Holy words. This has been It Is Written, a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God with John Dale, minister of the Glendale Road Church of Christ. Please visit us online at www.glendaleroadchurch.org.